Richard Cottingham, infamously known as the New York Ripper, the Torso Killer, and the Times Square Killer, committed a series of gruesome murders between 1967 and 1980. His heinous acts involved the murder of at least 18 young women and girls in New York and New Jersey, leaving a trail of terror and earning him notoriety in criminal history. When we drew up the last time, I always went... So start from where you're talking... You're, let me do it my way. Hold on. <laughs> Just so I got clear. The, the, well, street, the, clear. the street that the ice rink was on. Uh, let me explain to you. This way you know everything I know about this. Okay. Every time I went there, I came up the street going to that street. Here's the street going to the ice rink. Okay. This... Was the Garden State Parkway there yet? Or not even built yet? I don't know if it was built or not, but I didn't know where... I never, never seen the Garden State Parkway. Okay. I used to always come up the same way, up through Rivervale right up Riverdale Road, and then I wind up coming down this road here. This was the field, the cornfield, that I always, the road was back here. This time I came, and it looked kind of wet and everything, so I didn't, I used to just drive right off the road, drive back in, and turn the car around and face, and face this way. So I always knew, even if a cop car came by and seen me from here, by the time he got back here, I was gone into the woods. So I never brought my car there. So this time, I went up to here, and I, I went around this way. And I, my intention was to see if this was drier. And then, now on the other side, just like this, right from, right from here, that was all swamp or woods, whatever. In a chilling video interview, Cottingham provides disturbingly detailed accounts of his movements during the crimes. His ability to recall specifics even years later sheds light on his meticulous planning and routine, giving viewers a glimpse into the mind of a remorseless killer. And when I went in about 40 or 50 feet, the car stopped. I, could, I, I got stuck in the mud. Mm -hmm. So we stayed there about 10, 15 minutes. I was talking, I, I was trying to decide what to do. The cop car came up this way. And then he went by, and then I seen him back up. So I knew he spotted the car in there. So I got out of the car with her, and I ran into the, the woods. I didn't even know where I was going. Now the dogs, there was dogs in his house started barking. Either from me or the cop car or whatever. So all, that's your drift. So now I said, let me go over that way. So I stopped here, and she started screaming. She heard the cop car, and she's screaming. The cops were up there. They couldn't see where the screaming was coming from, but they, they were by that empty car. But we were now 40 or 50 feet into the woods. And the empty car is the victim's car. Right. It's her car. Right. Her car was right, right, right around here. We're, we're back back here. I could see the cops because they had flashlights and everything. But they couldn't see me, but they could hear her screaming. So I panicked, and I stabbed her. I tried to shut her up, and then I took off. And I ran behind this house, behind this house, and between these two houses, because the doors were backing from this house. And I came back across here. Now, the cops were out here, flashlights then. I ran right, they didn't see me. And I ran this way, so I, they're thinking I'm still running into the woods. I came back to the other way. And when I ran from that second house, I ran, a, I would say, a straight line, maybe it's, you know, a little curved or anything, I almost fell over the well. Okay. So if you get the address of this house... It's directly opposite. It's directly out from the end of the house. It's almost directly opposite, and I would say... 150 to 175 yards in. You'd have a, yeah, now it might, it looked like there's a whole new house in the set development there. Cottingham's routine and careful planning played a crucial role in his ability to recall specific details from the crimes. This insight into his methodical approach provides a disturbing understanding of how a serial killer operates and leaves an indelible mark on the psyche of those exploring the dark realms of criminal psychology. Like I said, 
I went to this place 20 times, mm -hmm. but I always would come up here and then, see, I could only go during the winter. That's another thing. It had to be a cold month because during the summer, this was all corn. You couldn't drive over. Okay. So in the winter, it was all cut down. You know, I, I'm not saying it could have been fall, but I mean, it had to, not summer or anything when the corn was growing. And I always would come up and then just drive right across, right across the field, turn around, and it's fine. You know, I might be over here one time here, yeah, but it was always usually within 50 feet. It was almost, uh, yeah, it was, it was beautiful because I, I could command this whole view. Mm -hmm. And I could, you know, and, and there was no traffic. I mean, maybe a car would go by every 10 minutes. That's how little traffic was back then. Mm -hmm. It was all cornfield, all woods and cornfield. There was no, this, the only light was at this corner. There was a traffic signal there? There was a traffic thing, you know, I, I think, it, but I think I, I think it used to just blink. I don't think it was a red and green. I think it was like a flashing, like a flashing yellow or flashing red type thing. Okay. So they didn't have to actually come to a stop. Go back so I can research this a little better. You, you mentioned you stabbed her. Do you know for sure? Like yeah. How many times you stabbed her? Anything? One time. Okay. Right in the face. The interview unveils Cottingham's predatory behavior including an incident where he stalked a potential victim in a car and insights into the locations where he disposed of the bodies. His narration paints a chilling picture of the calculated and cold-blooded nature of his crimes. I can tell you, she was dressed and she had a suit on. She had like a suit jacket and a tie. A tie? Yeah, a tie. About how old is she? Early 20s. I would say. Okay. Dark hair. You love dark hair. You, I, not, you know, the funny thing is, most of my victims are dark, but I like them much, too. So, all right, I, I, I have some things to work with on that. What kind of car? Any idea what kind of car it was? I have no idea. Okay. And it, it, it was a regular. I mean, it wasn't stick. That I know, but uh, now tell me about the well. How did you ever first find the well? Uh, in the beginning, I wanted to find a place to drop the body. But see, I always like to drop them near the side of the street so I can be found there easy. And most of them, you'll sign over the thing. Almost all mine were, but in the beginning I didn't think that way. But then I think, you know, I didn't want these people rotten, you know. Mm -hmm. So I got a little sentiment, I'll say, if you drop them near the street, somebody will find them in a day or two. But I, wa I walked, I, I, I might have just got out to take the leak or something. But I, I walked back, you could walk from this field, this field was all solid. This is, I mean, there's no water, no no wood, no swamp. But when you walk back in here, if you got about 40, 50 feet, it turned to swamp. You know, where, where there's actually water, you know, you couldn't actually walk dry. And I was walking back there to see if I could find a place to, you know, to hide a body. Cottingham targeted prostitutes in out-of-the-way locations, exploiting their vulnerability. This bullet point explores the grim reality of his crimes, shedding light on the darker corners of society where predators like Cottingham preyed on the marginalized. One was a hooker that I picked up in Little Ferry. There was a, hook, a, a hooker bar there in Little Ferry I used to go into. And uh, I'm pretty sure. And one was a waitress. I remember she was a waitress. From where? I don't know. I don't know. Local, local in the area, but I don't know where. I think she was she was young too. I think I'm not sure. And the other the other girl could be a blonde from Atlantic City, but I'm not sure. I'm not, that's what I say. I'm mi I mixed up. Of, it just sometimes it was one after the other. And then sometimes for six months I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. you know. Cottingham shocks viewers by claiming to have killed over 80 people, 
With a disturbing twist, he often let potential victims go. This revelation adds a layer of complexity to his psyche, challenging conventional perceptions of serial killers solely driven by bloodlust. I would say there's well over 80. You think that many? Well over. I've done some in Florida, Connecticut, part of New York, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Baltimore. Right. Any place within driving distance that was not connected to me, I would try. You know, my whole thing was not to make a pattern, which I never did. Not, and never to try to kill them the exact same way or to, you know, leave a signature. You know. I wasn't, I wasn't stupid, you know, and other than that one time in Hackensack where just luck, I would have been caught there. Right. Mm -hmm. I was never even, even close to getting caught. Contrary to expectations, Cottingham took no pleasure in the act of killing, but derived satisfaction from the thrill of escaping justice. This paradoxical aspect of his character adds a psychological dimension to the discussion, prompting viewers to delve into the mind of a remorseless criminal. That's why I didn't say, I said I'm not really like a standard serial killer. I, did, I didn't get a no joint on its own one. And that's the truth. Never had no joint. It was very hard. So what was the thrill? Was it more rape? Control? Tying no, up? It was the game. It was being able to get away with it. The stalking. The, the, to be able to... To be able to do it, it was like the perfect murder every time. You see something in the paper, a body was trying to hit, you never heard of it because there was never nothing after that. You know, no cops ever came around me or stiffed or anything like that you see on TV. Mm -hmm. It was getting away with it. The interview touches on various aspects of Cottingham's criminal activities, including his methods, motives, and the challenges of solving older cases. The discussion highlights the evolving nature of crime scenes over time, posing unique challenges for investigators and providing a comprehensive understanding of Cottingham's dark legacy.